Kyle here from allmediareviews.blogspot.com, uh, continuing on the uh, today, Friday, the 2nd of uh, December, 2022, the modern favorite modern progressive art rock albums list, the epic list that I, you know, I haven't done some of it, a little bit of it yesterday. The pace I'm going, this will probably take till the end of next week. Maybe a little earlier, but um, we'll see. And my apologies if it's long-winded in so many videos, but it, you know, it kind of ballooned out, and I didn't know how else to do it other than just sort of lightning round, and it just kind of devalues it. So anyway, number 177, Dirt Pro Robbins, the, Ro the, the Raven Locks, Act 1. You know, which I guess that and Act 2, I, I kind of split hairs with, um, but we'll see where the, the Act 2 shows up. Um, this album has maybe still their my favorite song by them, maybe their best song in um, Solemn Dream. Um if you look at it, you know, the thing is the, the Raven locks, arguably I could just do a redux and I would actually have all the Raven locks records together. Cause they're not that long. This is a 27 minute album. I mean, it's like uh, act one from the deer hunter. It's really like an EP in some ways, but anyway, solemn dream is like the biggest standout in that, you know, the vocal performance from Kate is amazing on that. And um, the crescendo and there's, it's just, it's fantastic. Um, the bird in the bird is in the bird cage. A closing track, "Fallen." Um, we forgot we were human. The same. This is just the beginning to end. Just a, just a terrific, you know, a really terrific introduction to Dirt Per Robbins. Um, you really couldn't go wrong with with this with this record. Um, but you know, they would make two more acts, and you know, the, those likely will be showing up as well as some of their other records. So anyway, uh, number one seventy seven. Number 176, Sunlit Youth from Local Natives. You know, I was looking at this last night, and I, people on Rate Your Music don't like this record much at all. They think it's their worst record. And I remember when it came out, it was a similar kind of criticism. Uh, it's under three stars as an average on here. Um, and I haven't, this came out in 2016, I, in September, right around the time of my wedding. A bunch of other stuff came out around the same time. The Deer Hunter Act 5, and um, I forget what other one. There was one, September of 16. Um... I, you know, Villainy, the Past Lives, those first two songs I remember really liking. But I remember this is, you know, local natives and the comparisons to these other bands I don't care for, like Grizzly Bear, I've never understood. But um, I don't even have the right, the, the primary one chosen here when I when I put this on the list by accident. Um, you know, I, I, I think I need to do a revisit of the local natives catalog. But um, I know when this came out, I thought it actually was a little better than the previous record. I kind of go back and forth. I like Violet Street, the one that came after, which I'll be talking about in a few minutes here probably. Um, but I still think this is – remember this being a very good record. Although, you know, there's so many records that I'm trying to put on this list. It, arguably, it might have gone lower or maybe not even been just like an honorable mention. But um, I think it was in my top ten from 2016, you know, and from, from my memory. So, yeah, um, Local Natives – Sunlit Youth uh, from 2016, number 176. Now we're at 175, finally. Jimmy Necco's The Heart X Edition, which this is the second version of his debut solo album in the sort, but the track list is different, and the biggest thing about this version is it has the full band playing on it, so, you know, is it ours? You could say it's ours. It's kind of weird. It's like an ours album, not a, only not under name. Um, the Bells is probably my favorite track on here. But, you know, it's got, or it's called Bells, actually, not The Bells. Gravity was a live staple. Darling, another live staple we heard for years. Mystery and The Heart, he, hearing them, I like, and Bring You Home, those first three tracks. I like The Heart arrangement as well, but I, I think there's something extra that that, that got that was included on this version that worked a little bit better. Just because, I don't know, for whatever reason, these songs translated better uh, with the band as, like, our songs. But, um, anyway, Jimmy Necco's... In 2011, the Heart, the X edition, number 175. So then we got Dirt Poor Robbins again, Queen of the Night, and you know, having listened to this album a fair number of times over the last few weeks, well, since it just came out, this is probably a little low for it. I've I went over a little over it a little bit in my albums of the year. I don't have the track list in front of me right on Rate Your Music, but um, in fact, I wonder if someone submitted it. Probably not. Um, they, um, well, here you go. I don't know why it wasn't, why we didn't try to add the track list. 
besides Unchante, which is the stand, one of the standout tracks from 2022 for me, it has Penelope Graves and Babylon and Falling Upwards into Love. Those are like my four favorites. But I think, you know, this is a really well composed record that, you know, of course it's a soundtrack of sorts, but it the track order works. Um, you know, it's like it's both it goes with the film and is independent and it's kind of even it's ambitious even even for them because they never were doing music that was for an actual like film until this so um in that sense it stands out from the rest of their catalog but yeah we'll see you know how much replay value it gets i think it will get a lot of replay value um but you know in 175 or 174 might be putting it a little bit low at this point so the one 173 rounding out this chunk of five Released on March 8, 2005, Buy Our Intention Will Buy You Unicorn, the second album from Cat is Fly. It's a long record. The first album that I heard from Cat is Fly when I got into them, it was like in 2006. I heard about them a little before that. Um, but, you know, and, and the production and Chris Ruff's vocals, I struggle, I have struggled with, I still at times struggle with a little bit. Even on the previous record, Did You Know uh, People Can Fly, um... But there's a lot of really good tracks in here with his moments. Crimson Solitude, Calm of Calamity. The last three tracks especially, they, the, the sort of blueprint for that the trilogy, the, the title track, By Our Intention Will Buy You Unicorn, Set Sail the Prairie, the title of the next record, and Horses Galloping on Sailboats. Actually, among those three, the last track is the one I like the most. That sort of crescendo-y, synthy, epic kind of ending to this album concept about an album that's the start of a trilogy of concept albums about creation and the life on earth in effect um but yeah osmosis and sea you know they have like these little piano moments little sections that i always enjoy i think they're more like clear cut on set sail the prairie and horses galloping this album it's like you kind of have to wait and pick your spots but then when you get to them they're still enjoyable um i think actually if they I don't know what was if this album got remastered because I've always kind of felt like I wanted to love this album more than I did and it grew on me some but a remastering could actually make this album even better potentially anyway but anyway that's the uh number 173 cat is flies buy your intention will buy you unicorn from 2005 so moving on so we got local natives again with violet street uh their album from 2019 april 26 2019 it came out there's a, a number of like highlights, but the one that I I always think of this record for most probably is when I when am I gonna lose you? It's got it's a banger. It, it reminds me of uh, the family crest in a lot of ways. It's very catchy, very memorable. Um, yeah, there's a funk element on some of these songs on this record. Um, it's again with local natives, a band that I I've loved for since they were Calvul at Rest. Unfortunately, I got. I've kind of like not been as attached to them, even though when I hear their records, they come out as I used to be, but I really need to revisit them. I'm guilty of that, but it's just been sort of in the shuffle of other music and everything. But um, yeah, this is, this is still a really good record. It was in my top 10 records for 2019 for various reasons. Um, but I know that they were doing some different things like, you know, bringing in funk and R and B. Um, but you know, it's still local natives and, you know, it's on my list for a reason because I really love them. Uh, great live band, of course, too. I've, I have, I've skipped them the last couple times they've been here, but I saw them like six or seven times. Every show's been great. Anyway, number 171, Block Party's A Weekend in the City. So, you know, you say, well, is Block Party really prog? No, but this album has a song that, that could, I've always contended is prog, the song uh, Uniform. It's the my favorite, my favorite song from them. So, you know, to the day, their best song. This album, though, it really has a lot of great energy. Um, Hunting for Witches, uh, Song Song for Clay, Kreutzberg. I mean, I know it's dark lyrically, where it's um, about sort of youth in the city, <laughs> kind of. You know, it's a, I don't know. I always kind of got that impression from from it. And their debut album, I like a fair amount too. Although I've always been more more kind of leaning toward this album as the record that I like the most. And it just kind of came out of nowhere. I knew them as a band that Mew had toured with, maybe opened with in the U.S. It was just in Europe. Um, and it's like, well, they're a little bit like Mew, and they're a little bit like Battles and stuff like that. Battles, their debut album came out the same year. Um, that math rock with sort of 
post punk whatever um but i think they they did some different things on this record and again you know you, you take you take yeah yeah i mean i just remembered getting addicted to this record and it's like you know this is sort of prog um where's uniform on it's number the fifth track this is the vinyl version that i have on here but um i think you know their debut debut album um i'm forgetting the name right now i don't even have this listed in my catalog it's weird because i bought this on cd and then eventually got the vinyl silent alarm everyone thinks of silent alarm for it and weekend in the city sort of you know wasn't a, a, f a favorable follow-up i kind of feel the opposite i like silent alarm i like weekend in the city more um so anyway block party is weekend in the city which you know i would say it's it's clear cut that both Foles and everything everything are bands that oh at least something to block party and so, and th both those bands are doing sort of artsy prog, um, and so that's kind of why Block Party still fits in the, into this list at 171. Number 170, Brooke Wagner's "Go Easy, Little Doves." I remember when this came out; I was just totally in awe of it. She's a singer songwriter, does piano main piano, you know, driven music, but a lot of it and it is is orchestrated. Um, and this album, you know, because cause she's classically trained, um, you know, it's like I mentioned. Yeah, I saw her with paper out, and it kind of totally won me over. And and I just, you know, I couldn't believe how much I enjoyed this one, the title track especially. But um, this record, and she has some other records I enjoy too, but this record has always been the standout for me. Um, yeah, Chamber Pop, you know, very, it's very layered. You know, it's just, you know, sublime arrangements on this album. And she has a really good voice, Brooke Wagner. Um, I'm not sure if she's still making music because I remember seeing that she, you know, she's she's had a family and everything like that. But um, this to me is her masterpiece, actually. So came out October 6, 2009. Number 170, Brooke Wagner's "Go Easy, Little Doves." Number 160, number 171, one, number, number 169, Cloud Cult's "The Meaning of Eight. Again, another Cloud Cult album in here. <laughs> I'm saying, you know, we're gonna ha see several albums from many artists, and Cloud Cult's not an exception in that vein. This album to me is the first album where they really kind of started to hit on all cylinders with their songwriting and, you know, from their memorable tracks. Chain Reactions, Chemicals Collides, Pretty Voice. Some of these are more singer songwriter, but I felt, I feel like when I listen to this, 2x2x2 two by two by two is another one that's catchy and layered and it's a clever arrangement. Um, the concept al album about, you know, the number eight. I mean, all the Cloud Cult albums, other than really their first album, are. are largely based on that the, the tragic loss of their their son Caden they always connect th them in different ways on the and this is no different I don't know if it, it would have been his eighth birthday when this would have come when this came out you know unfortunately he passed away when he was like two um but yeah I mean it, I guess well you know because this does have a little bit of the traits of their previous records and a lot of their records are really long like in terms of track numbers and this has 18 tracks but for whatever reason, compared to some of the previous albums like Hippopotamus and They Live on the Sun, this album seems to flow better for me. And that's kind of why I've always looked at it from a production standpoint and just sort of a track after track standpoint and like sort of memorable songs that we always would that I'd, I'd, I've seen them play live. This is their first in that run of albums. Um, I'm not saying that they changed as a band, but it, or they, it was like a breakthrough of sorts. I just feel like this is sort of and I know some members left. This kind of the the start of a, this this really um, transition of some sort for Cloud Cult in terms of making albums with better production and just sort of con their songwriting prowess picked up to me in a lot of ways on this album. Um, so yeah, the meaning of eight from two thousand seven from Cloud Cult. Oops, why am I going to Cloud Cult's catalog? <laughs> I can just show it. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. So from that point on, all these records, the ones before it are have their their charm, but they're just they're not as addictive to me. So. Anyway, number 168, A Formal Horse, uh, Here Comes a Man from the Council with a Flamethrower from 2019, um, November 22nd, 2019. I know it's a mouthful, you know, they're, they're not compromising anything, you know, as you look, they even have track ratings on here. The title track is one of the ones I always think of this for, but B and uh, Petroleum, was, I made a comment on here, yeah, um, it wasn't on here, it was maybe in the blog itself, but, um... Yeah, I mean, they're a heavy prog band with, you know, a lot of textures, some samples, female vocals. Um, you know, I mean, this is their debut album, um, A Formal Horse. I got to credit Lorenzo from Alt Pro Court talking about them. I don't think it was 2021. 
or maybe it was late in 2020 talking about new albums and with their record that came out meat mallet that year um but i actually found that i i did enjoy this one a little bit more even um again and not a short record like the quad in terms of tracks it's 16 tracks but um you know they have lots of different moments whether it be a rhythm guitar riff you know some sort of vocal arrangement or just kind of a twist in the percussion um this record is you know it's here comes a man from the council with a flamethrower. It's definitely sort of very cerebral. It doesn't really, you know, it, that's a statement you can't really get out of your head. You know, it's it's there. It's not light music, but you know, they hit on all cylinders. I don't know. I guess who would I? You know, the bands that, besides Tool. I mean, I, I I don't like Tool that much, but I like bands that are influenced by them. There's some other bands they remind me of. You know, like Muse and. Um, you know, bands that emphasize sort of dynamics really well that are heavy at points. Um, but yeah, they're avant. Yeah, a little bit like Major Parkinson, I suppose you could say. Because uh, their their music is left and center, or like Time of Orchids. But it's not too left of center that, you know... I mean, it's not it's not a record that I would listen to every day, or their, these albums from um, uh, Formal Horse. But I think, that, you know... The, they're, when they do, when they when they succeed, they really you know come up with something really unique, and their debut album is, is an impressive debut album. I know they had some music before this, some EPs and stuff. So number one sixty eight. Um, let's see here. So what am I doing for time? Because I don't want this to balloon up. This is sixteen minutes already. So we'll maybe do one, maybe two more lists. So okay, number one sixty seven, the Mercury Tree's Countenance. This is clearly my favorite album from the Mercury Tree. They've done some sort of um, what do you call it? microtonal records since this. Um, and gotten more heavier and te more technical at points, but I think I found that this is while it is heavy and math rocky, math rocky, it has the math rock element. The songwriting was still there, more so than maybe on some of the records I've done since. Like I, I found that this one I was sort of like, why have I never heard of this band? Um, from mass, mass jazzy, they're trying to say you know math, j <laughs> jazzy math rock kind of thing. Um, to, you know, let's see here, Otoliths, I remember, you know, I mean, it's a three, they're a three-piece band, too, Ben, um, Ben Spees is sort of the, the, one of the main songwriters, but yeah, they, they kind of, they, they enjoy doing things very, in very technical form, but I just found that this one worked a little more, a little better than some of the others, and I just kind of, it was in my top 10 in 2014 for that reason, um, you know, I, I'm friends with them, like Ben specifically. Uh, you know, he's a guy I talk to occasionally on Facebook and everything. And um, yeah, no, this the Countenance is clearly my favorite record from the Mercury Tree, at number uh, one. What is it? One sixty seven. One sixty six. Uh, South of Reality from the Clennon, the Clennon, the Claypool Lennon Delirium, Les Claypool and jo and Sean um, and Sean Lennon. Um, this, you know, I'm not a massive Primus fan. I, I saw them live. I know they did, like, the Rush tribute, the Rush album, and they've done some other, like, Pink Floyd and everything like that. And the humor, you know, and I like Les Claypool's um, Electric Apricot, the jam band parody film. that's sort of like um, uh, Spinal Tap for the jam bands. Um, found that hilarious many years ago. Um, but his music itself, this is one of, if not the, the biggest thing I've ever enjoyed from him. And I found, like, Having Sean Lennon involved, yeah, there's a the psychedelia on this album really works. Um, yeah, it sounds like his father, but that's I have less issue with someone who sounds like his father as opposed to someone who sounds exactly like the famous voice, and I just don't find his like like the guy from Tame Impala. Anyway, um, this is you know it's a fun record. I, I bought it on vinyl. Um, it really is sort of what you would expect in some ways, where it's. It's the two styles, you know, Sean and, and, or just think Beatles, John Lennon Beatles. It's very, it's kind of like that. Like, you know, you're talking about Sgt. Pepper's or Magical Mystery Tour. It channels that a lot. You have a little bit of the humor from um, Les Claypool still in here, but it doesn't uh, overstay its welcome. A Mess Realm, I think that was one of my go-tos from, from memory. The last time I listened to it was 2019. I haven't revisited this. Again, I bought the vinyl recently, though, but um, they have a previous record I've never listened to, and it might deserve to be on this list at some point as well but blood and rockets you know yeah it's this is psychedelic prog really with you know it's not a long record it's 47 minutes it's about the right length anyway um south of reality from 2019 yeah they have i've never uh, i think the artwork is kind of similar monolith of of phobos yeah and actually the rate your music likes that one slightly more although you can see more people found south of reality than that but um and they have an ep as well lime and limpid green 
Anyway, number 166. 165. Note uh, an album that was given away for free online. The, the band's from, I want to say Italy. Italy or Germany. I'm not sure what. Oh, it's Germany, actually. I remember because Long Distance Calling from Germany also. And, you know, I, I got into Long Distance Calling the same year. Um, this is, it's a post-rock album with some blues elements. And one of the best things about it is they use samples like from um, Good Will Hunting and some others that capture the vibe on these. And look at, look at the track list. It's just composition one, two, three, four, five, and six. You know, composition three is the longest one. Um, the dynamics just work really well, and they, you know, and the use. Of, I'm a sucker for post rock with 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 samples, and it's on their Bandcamp still. So I bought a copy. Um, I'm I'm. They're still kind of one of the most super super obscure and you know slept on artists. Now there's someone one of my friends who didn't like them, but um, I just think this is a terrific um recording and it's you know if you you want to hear post rock that's not like post explosions in the sky it's more kind of textured and you know atmospheric with samples you know i knew about this band way before um you know uh nordic giants and some of the other bands that, like ghost uh god is an astronaut i was getting into them around the same time and i would say yeah a lot of people know god is an astronaut this would be one to check out if you like god is an astronaut so, um, My City of Ghosts, Stars and Hours from 2009 from Note, number 165. 164, As Tall as Lions, You Can't Take It With You. This this is the last As Tall as Lions album, which is sad. And before this, I had sort of been on the fence about them, but this album kind of convinced me that they really were more, you know, textured. That song, Circles, always, I always think of The Deer Hunter, and they toured with The Deer Hunter, I believe. They also toured with Mute Math. But, um... Yeah, they're great at they they come up with these really warm, busy, energetic sections on a lot of their songs. Um, the percussion, especially, and the vocal arrangements, the vocal harmonies. I you know I miss these guys. I like that documentary they put out, um, but I, I always felt like at least they won out on a on a, a really high note with this this album. You can't take it with you. I bought it on vinyl. Um, you know. I'd say, you know, if you are a fan of the Deer Hunter, you don't know this band, you ne you should definitely check them out. They're not going to be like the super big chamber band that the Deer Hunter was, but they have a lot of the dynamic elements. Um, also, I think it was this album. It might have been this album that has a bonus track that Kimbra is on. This one or the one before. I can't remember. and She's not listed here, but it would have to be on maybe one of these other ones maybe. I can't remember if you click on the versions. Cause I think it was a bonus track. But I, I learned about that later, and you know it hasn't been tagged on on Rate Your Music. But anyway, you can't take it with you from um, August eighteenth, two thousand nine, uh, from uh, As Tall as Lions, number two, th uh, number one sixty four. They're a band that I discovered through that Alternative Press magazine, the you know hundred bands issue. I think it was two thousand six. Had Protest the Hero, had um, Receive Men and Sirens, a lot of other bands I I, I got came to literally love. Anyway, number 163, we see Local Natives again with their second album, their sophomore record, Hummingbird. Um, you know, I know at the time I loved this. It had been a really big deal for this to come out because, of course, we had Call at Rest and we had the debut album, Gorilla Manor, and then it was a number of years. That was 2009 when Gorilla Manor came out. Um, and again, I need to I sort of do a, like a revisiting of their whole catalog. I, I did, I've never done a video on Local Natives slash Call at Rest, but... Um, you and I and Heavy Fee. I mean, I remember just this album really flowed well. Um, it wasn't Gorilla Manor Part 2 exactly. You know, of course, I hate the comparisons of these bands I don't care for at all. But it so sort of happens. I, I always compare them more to annuals. That the, the best comparison is annuals to me for, you know, or like Mute Math or um, you just watch them live. And they would just destroy those band live because they have the, the group drum jams and, you know. Um... Yeah, I, I remember in the Mount Washington, there's a lot of songs that are sort of highlights, Black Balloons. You know, the other band I would compare them to is Full. They're more in the Full's Mute Math vein than Animal Collective and, um, you know, Grizzly Bear and everything like that and Vampire Weekend. But, you know, it's semantics. It's it's really, you know, everyone hears things differently, I guess. But, yeah, this is a, this is a very good record from Local Natives. And one that, you know, probably I, I need to reassess just because, you know, it's been many years. It came out in 2013, January 29th. But Hummingbird, I, I put it at 163 for now. 
on the on the epic uh, progressive art rock list. So going on, I'll do one more, and then that's about it for this video. Dirt Pro Robbins, The Ravenlocks, Act 2, um, which like The Ra Ravenlocks, Act 1, is, again, 31 minutes. It's sort of, a, they're very short records. And again, what well, you could say the whole Ravenlocks series really should be considered one album. And maybe I'll do a redux and move that thing in there. It will probably be Fairmont higher, actually. But this has Speak to Me, uh, Evergreen, I love. Solemn Awakening, I believe, reprises Solemn Dream, part of it. Uh, the only song on here that kind of sticks out like a sore thumb is this one, Drinking a Drink of My Drink. It's like uh, 99 bottles of beer on the wall. It, it was sort of charming a couple times, and then I just kind of skip it now. That's the only, you know, but the rest of this album I, I enjoy. Um, although I guess, you know, you look at this in the Act 1, I don't know, I kind of think maybe Act 1, I probably should have should flip these two, but... Um, I think more properly, I think the three of them should just go in as, as that compilation that came out, and it should just take these out. Um, but yeah, this is a just you know if you like their Robbins and haven't heard this or any of the the Ravenlocks, this is one you definitely need to check out. It came out September thirtieth, twenty fourteen, and I put it at you know number one sixty two on my list for now. <laughs> number one sixty one in the Dead Deadwood from Venard from twenty twenty, um, an album that I sort of. Slept on a little bit when it came out. It came out late in the year in 2020, November 6th. Um, but, uh, yeah, like the Fork in the Road epic at the end, a lot of people compared to Ocean Size, which I can understand. I mean, the Ocean Size always had, at least their first three rock records, had great um, epic closing tracks. And this is really this is really sort of in a similar vein. Um, you know, I mean, I, I again, I haven't listened to this album since that year, but... Um, you know, I, I, I remember after, you know, like I actually I did listen to it a couple months ago again. And I remember that there was one track, one track that kind of stood out besides the closing track. And I want to say it was um, Super Sleuth, but um, it, it differs in some ways. You know, the cover, the art is darker than his first two records for an art. I mean, yeah, it's like Ocean Size in some way. Um, you know, he put out that song oh, that that was more noise oriented and i wasn't crazy about it like earlier in the year they have it on here dick privilege and i, I i'm actually given the, the the fact i wasn't thrilled with dick privilege i'm glad it didn't end up on that but you know i know that he mike Vinart, you know is always writing music and so he doesn't really you know and put out a single maybe but you know this album just kind of just like oh i have a new album here you go it was very kind of a spur of the moment thing um unexpected but yeah, in the dead Deadwood, you know, one of uh, you know, one six number one sixty one from Vernard solo band from twenty twenty. Godspeed you, Black Emperor. Uh, lift your skinny fist like to tennis to heaven. I probably should be putting this album a little higher, because in some ways this is like the definitive post rock album. Um, and push comes to shove, I probably still pick this as my favorite Godspeed record. It's two, it's four songs, all between eighteen and twenty two minutes. Kind of this the structure of like Soft Machines Third or Tales from Tropical Africa Oceans from from Yes. Storm is probably my biggest highlight. The first, I think it's the first one. Storm is the first piece. Yep, I mean the thing with Godspeed is pretty much most of the songs that work well for me are the ones that sort of have the crescendos and the drum parts. Um, and get really big and you know layered the ones that go into like noise and drone I, I tend to get lost in and while this album has some of that i felt i feel like there's more flow on this record compared to some of their other records now having revisited right right around the time i saw them live and i've listened to it a couple times since that was like four or five years ago i kind of feel like there's still there's enough moments on this album that's that's got filler that i don't love it Maybe as much as much as I once did, but that being said, it's still a very ambitious record, and it's it's iconic in a lot of ways from the, at least the 21st century music. So anyway, Godspeed, you Black Emperor. Lift your skinny fists. Lift your skinny fists like ha like a tennis to heaven. And the word your is Y R, uh, with a period. So uh, number 159, uh, Never Any White Lights, uh, Act One. Goodbye, friends of the heavenly bodies. I've talked about them. I did a video on Never Any White Lights uh, back in 2021. The be the best the, my favorite tracks on this are it has probably probably my two favorite Never in White Light tracks are the 
the song, um, our final hymn with Jimmy, the Jimmy Necco of ours, of course, the, the, um, the last track on it, it's just melancholy. It's so sad in a lot of ways and kind of peaceful in a lot of other ways. And then of course the, the one that most people know them for the grace, um, right here. So that both of those are, so this is, this is kind of weird the way this is tagged. Um, but you know, it's all guess. but yeah, I mean this, this, he played some of these songs on that special live stream back in 2020. Um, it's a mood record, but it's so, so like, I, it, I can't like be in awe of it at times that it's just, I need to sort of like therapy music. And this is my medicine in a lot of ways. Um, which has a lot of value to it. I mean, it's atmospheric. You could give it a lot of just subscriptions. You have all these different Judah Nagler from um, the Velveteens on it, a band I like. Most a lot of Canadian musicians are the guests. Da um, you know, he's talked about these. I mean, you know, I do I know this album from beginning to end? No, just mainly because you know I listen to more just for the way it listens to. I hear it begin like just as a whole. I don't think oh, this is a highlight. This is a highlight. It's not the energy is not that high on this album compared to like say Act Three or whatever. So, um, but yeah, I mean it's it's still an album that I will I will always go back to. That's the best way to put it. I think. Um, Never in white lights. Act One. Goodbye, friends of the heavenly bodies from two thousand five, August twenty third. So number 158, um, one of the definitive math rock albums of the 21st century, at least, Battles Mirrored. Really the only Battles album I really like, actually. I mean, really appreciate. Uh, the biggest reason for that, I say, and I, like, I probably would want to include some of the like the EPs and singles they released before this, is because of uh, Tyende Braxton um, vocals. I found I grew to like them, and then hearing them without him kind of um threw me off and i just didn't it's kind of like listening to opeth without the growling um my favorites you know there's atlas tonto um you know rainbow you know it's just the weird vocals sort of have their charm um and sort of the the, the dynamics the sort of yeah the, the king crimson element to their a lot of their, their music it's a fun playful almost danceable record and it just kind of grew on me although it sort of had its limit for that but being that as it may i still think it's it's a record that's very impressive for a debut album and it's a record i i can still go back to a little bit like adabasi shank it's got i could i could put it on the background or i can listen to it closely either way um there's a lot to sort of digest and uncover and appreciate about it so i think that's going to wrap this one up i mean um you know, I know that the pace is this. Well, let's see what, what time it is. I could maybe do one more. All right, we'll do five more, and then I got to call it this video at least uh, for being final because we're at like twenty some odd minutes probably. Uh, yeah, we're at. Oh, actually, we're over thirty minutes. You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna stop for now. You can sort of see Esperanza Spalding will be for the next video. But thank you for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't subscribed, and we'll see you next time.